It's 3 o'clock, so now seems like an excellent time to start our last panel of the afternoon. Uh, our first presentation will come from Diana Muntz, and Kyle Davies will be uh, doing the discussion job for that. So, Great, thank you. Uh, the purpose of this particular study is to look at some of the most prominent narratives, whoa, we got it back there, surrounding the 2016 election outcome. And of course, the most prominent narrative that we've all been exposed to is what we call the left behind thesis. The idea that it's people who either uh, have declined in their financial well-being or haven't recovered at the same rate as some others have after the recession who are responsible for the bulk of Trump's support. In addition, um, there's also the possibility that people's uh, overall sense of how difficult things are economically has gone up. Lots of coverage, of course, of inequality and other kinds of issues suggesting that uh, the American system isn't what it once was. This received a huge amount of coverage in large part because of aggregate patterns that came out of the fact that education was overwhelmingly the strongest predictor of Trump support. That is, less educated people were overwhelmingly more likely to support Trump. In addition to that, though, uh, there were some surprise wins for Trump in what we think of as Rust Belt areas. And those two things really contributed to this overall narrative. There are two problems that don't kind of fit in that narrative very clearly. One is this massive literature that we have in political psychology on the very limited extent to which people are able to politicize their personal economic difficulties. And this is, of course, a hypothesis that's been looked at over a very long period of time. And there's just a huge number of failed studies and a tiny number of ones that really show people are capable of politicizing personal experience effectively. In addition to that, the timing is kind of strange. Um, if you look, for example, at the decline in manufacturing in the United States, yes, it's way, way down. But actually, since 2009, 2010, it's increased. And what we know about how voters respond to uh, political change is not usually that there's a 10-year lag before they notice that they've lost their jobs in manufacturing and so forth. So the timing of blaming it on loss of manufacturing jobs is somewhat uh, inconsistent with what we know about the standard American voter. You could say, on the other hand, it's economic anxiety. It's not that they're actually experiencing it right now, but they fear it in the future. So that's another possible interpretation of um, the left behind voter thesis. Sorry, I'm getting too ahead of me. Um, the second narrative that I explore here is what I call perceived status threat. And really what this is is an umbrella label for the idea that people feel their group, their people, are threatened in some way. And the most obvious form of that that was talked about a lot during the campaign is the perceived threat that was felt by powerful status groups, men, whites, Christians, and so forth. There was a, a whole lot of uh, conversations surrounding Trump's very straightforward statements that seemed highly racist and sexist and so forth. Many people argued that this attitude was just latent. These attitudes were latent out there and all he did was step in, articulate those views and take advantage of those sentiments. In addition, uh, race and gender and religion are also a part of the pattern of voting that we see for Trump. And one of the fascinating things that there's, there's now just under, I think about 10 studies, uh, experimental studies in uh, social psychology journals, all of which use as a treatment uh, an article about the US becoming a majority minority nation. And, or minority majority, <laughs> I got that backwards there. Um, overwhelmingly, there has been coverage really, I think it was the 2000, 14, when the first article came out saying, you know, the kids who are in grade school now, they're already majority minority in the United States. So the idea that this nation is changing, changing very rapidly in the near future, is something that many people 
found threatening. And in fact, in these psych studies, in these experiments, people randomly assigned to see something about the rise of minorities in the United States became far more negative toward outgroups of all kinds, not uh, strictly racial, but also uh, more negative toward women and uh, Muslims and so on and so forth. So the second form that I think perceived status threat takes is global status threat. And by that, I mean Americans' fear of being dominated by other countries. There's been a lot of coverage, like with the rise of a majority minority country, that America isn't what it used to be, that our global dominance has either ended or is going to end pretty soon. And certainly scholars debate this and whether it's true or not, but there's a lot of coverage suggesting, you know what, we're not going to be the global superpower. We're going to be one of many superpowers in the future. And this loss of status as a country is something else that's been found to produce feelings of threat and anxiety in members of the public. Now, I put those two things under the same umbrella because in many cases it's very difficult uh, for people to separate the causes of their sense of status threat. For example, we know that domestic racial prejudice predicts opposition to trade. Uh, it also predicts opposition to immigration. Now, both of those things um, are, with trade in particular, it's kind of odd because it's products coming in, not people. But we know that racial attitudes and attitudes towards issues like that are tightly interrelated. It also uh, is true that a desire to dominate others, as in social dominance orientation, it predicts attitudes toward immigration, trade, uh, and it's tied to domestic prejudice. Obviously, it was originally developed as a measure of uh, prejudicial attitudes in general. So although many of these kinds of issues that were widely talked about in this campaign could be viewed as economic issues by some, um, what has been found for the most part is that these issue attitudes are not driven by people's personal economic self-interest. They might claim that the nation as a whole is going to suffer economically, uh, but not so much the individuals themselves. So the data that I'm going to bring to bear on these questions is really two different sources. Um, one is a panel survey. And in this case, I have one wave of data from October of 2012, before the 2012 presidential election. And then again, four years later, in October of 2016, immediately before the Trump election. I'm going to augment uh, this with a cross-sectional sample from October of 2016 from a completely different source. The disadvantage is it's cross-sectional. The advantage, uh, as I'll point out, is that we have a few more measures to directly get at some of these hypotheses uh, in that survey. So first of all, what changed? How is it that uh, Donald Trump was able to get more votes than Mitt Romney was. How did that happen? Well, the first thing I looked at is the kinds of things uh, that we think of as potentially undergirding candidate support. Did those things change? Did people change their minds about trade? Or did the candidates change where they located themselves? Because we have multiple moving parts going on in any given election. So what you can see here is in 2012, uh, the S stands for the average American. Basically, people and the two major candidates, the Republican and the Democrat, were perceived as more or less identical in their positions on trade. Um, by 2016, what we see is a great deal of polarization. Uh, the average American had become more protectionist, uh, but the biggest change was really in where they located the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate on trade. Uh, despite Hillary Clinton's protestations about not really liking NAFTA, uh, she came to be seen as being much more pro-trade than the Democrat in 2012, which is interesting. And of course, Trump, not surprisingly, far more anti-trade. Another issue that we know uh, is salient for people is the idea of China being a threat to America's global status. And if you look at this layout here, you see that it, basically the Americans as a whole were more worried about China than either of the two candidates uh, as they perceived them in 2012. By 2016, though, uh, Trump had relocated the Republican candidate position to 
China is a threat. Uh, great change in the position of the candidate um, from 2012 to 2016. Slight movement on the Democratic side, also, you know, greater polarization, but not nearly as big as what Trump did to what the Republican position was perceived to be. And then finally on immigration, this is one of the things that um, is somewhat of a surprise, except that I have now found it in the Chicago Council on Global Affairs surveys and many other sources, and that is from 2012 to 2016, attitudes toward immigration became more positive. Uh, they, people became more pro-path to citizenship. They became more against the fence or wall. Um, Surprisingly, despite uh, all of Trump's rhetoric, we see no evidence that the public was led in a more anti-immigration direction. And that's true if we look at Republicans as well as Democrats separately as well. Again, the pattern we see is one of far greater polarization with the Democrat way on one side, the Republican on the other, and the average American somewhere in the middle, but not very close to either candidate in this case on this issue. So Trump certainly moved in a more anti-immigration direction, but in so doing, he actually made himself more distant from where the average American was. Okay, those are the kind of requirements for anything to have, um, I don't know why this won't go, there we go, uh, to change. So in order to explain people changing their vote from 2012 when they voted, let's say, for a Republican uh, or a Democrat, perhaps, and voting for a candidate of a different party in 2016, we know that for the most part, people vote for the same party over and over and over again. And that, in fact, also happens in this panel. About 90% of people vote for the exact same party in 2012 and 2016. But as we know, elections can be changed by fairly small margins like this one. So it's worth looking at which of these attitudes that were asked in both 2012 and 2016 shifted significantly over time, and thus might have the potential to be drivers of the shift in favor of Trump. Party identification did become very slightly more Republican, but significantly so during this period. People were more likely to identify as Republican. Again, these are the same people, so we're able to statistically identify even very small differences. Social dominance orientation also increased. And for those of you who think of social dominance orientation as a personality trait, there's actually already a bunch of research out there that shows that when people feel like their group status is threatened, their level of social dominance orientation goes up. So on one hand, social dominance orientation was originally developed to be a measure of prejudice uh, toward outgroups. But I, in this particular case, rather than use something to represent those kinds of attitudes like um, Dan's measure of stereotypes, because we're talking about threats, social dominance seem more uh, appropriate. Because if you have stereotypes in your head that say minorities are unintelligent and lazy, there's really no reason for you to be threatened by them, right? So the kind of indicator that suggests you do feel threat and you feel like your group's place in the hierarchy is being uh, wrongfully you know, shifted is much more relevant to the kind of status threat that I'm talking about. In addition, uh, I include in my model the positions of the parties, candidates, and of voters on each of these issues. So the hypothesis in this case would be that people who are now closer to one candidate relative to another should be more likely to shift in that direction. Overall, just I'm not going to go through every single independent variable and how it changed, but overall the Democratic candidate became much more distant uh, from the average voter relative to the Republican candidate on trade. Big shift there where Republicans are now closer to the average American. The Republican candidate also moved closer to the average American on China. So again, uh, by virtue of where he positioned himself, Trump was able to move himself closer to how the average American felt. On immigration, though, the Republican candidate became actually more distant from the average American. Uh, and as I said, it's because Trump's stance really um, hopscotched over uh, the average person. And so while the American in general were coming more pro-immigration, or at least more sympathetic 
toward immigrants and refugees and so forth, and that's true, by the way, three or four different questions suggest the same general pattern, um, Trump became too extreme uh, on that issue for many people relative to the Democrat. Okay. Um, I looked at three different outcomes. They're all coded so that high is more supportive of Trump. I'm not going to talk about the specifics, but a feeling thermometer advantage of the Republican over the Democrat in both years, uh, a candidate preference for the Republican versus any other candidate, and then the third measure, which is one, the one most people are interested in, is Trump versus a Clinton vote. And in this case, I limit the sample strictly to people who are validated voters, people who actually did turn out to vote in this election. The way I approach this is to look at what kind of change in these independent variables drives a change in the direction of supporting Trump. Uh, and fixed effects analysis of panel data at the individual level like this is really advantageous, as Kelly uh, mentioned before, because when you use a lag dependent variable, often the effect has nothing to do with actual change over time in the independent variable. The other kind of thing that happens with like random effects models or mixed models is that you have potential confounding going on in your model at the same time. And by far the, the greatest strength of this approach is that any kind of estimates you get of the effect of change over time in your independent variable on changing your dependent variable is completely unaffected by any kind of time invariant factor, meaning that you don't need control variables for any kind of thing that doesn't change over time. What this does is it reduces the risk of omitted variable bias. That is, you don't have to specify the exact precise right model uh, in order to get the right answer. So basically, my analysis ignores all between subject variants and only looks at people serving as their own controls. And if they changed in, let's say, their immigration attitude over time, how did that affect the likelihood that they would shift toward the Republican candidate in 2016. Okay, I'm going to start by looking at the personal economic hardship thesis. Um, we did allow partisanship to vary, uh, so you can see partisanship in this case is accounting for some of the shift toward Trump. Um, we looked at changes over time in people's incomes and the likelihood that they were unemployed. Uh, both of those variables, by the way, go up, as you'd expect. But nonetheless, this would be able to catch people who didn't increase as much as other people did. Those people uh, would be singled out here, and that would be, should be predictive of Trump support, according to the personal economic hardship thesis. People's subjective assessments of their own family financial situations, whether they thought trade had had positive or negative effects on their own family financial situation. That, by the way, did not change at all from 2012 to 2016, completely flat. Uh, no difference uh, over time, and it also doesn't predict the outcome measure. We also linked, by virtue of um, people's zip codes, the area, the zip code area unemployment rate and the percent manufacturing in that area, as well as the median income in that area. And the reason we did that is because, as an extension of self-interest, you could easily see how living in a community that had been decimated by the loss of manufacturing jobs could make you lose things personally, even though you personally aren't the ones who lost the man manufacturing jobs. So it could have an effect on a community that is very much uh, experienced by the individual. Yes, it's change, except obviously down at the bottom because we only have a census uh, every 10 years. When we look at the area unemployment uh, interacted with WAVE, it's telling us do areas with high unemployment, are they more likely to shift toward Trump? Uh, so those, because they're time invariant in this model, because we don't have every year new statistics on uh, unemployment by zip code area and so forth, um, what you're seeing is to what extent do these does change in these independent variables affect change in each of the dependent variables across the top. And what you see here is a lot of nothing, right? Um, this, these are the coefficients with everything in the model, but if I take everything else out and only leave these variables in, you get the very same thing. That is, um, no evidence that we can find 
of people politicizing their own personal financial situation. Now, in the um, cross-sexual evidence, which I'm not going to have time to go through, we also asked people about three different sources of future economic anxiety. Are you worried you're not going to have enough savings for your retirement? Are you worried that an unexpected medical bill could, you know, do your family in? Are you worried about not having saved enough money to send your children to college? So these are all future-oriented financial worries. Again, it doesn't predict shifting in the direction of Trump support. Uh, if you put it in a cross-sectional model, it would, but there isn't any change over time um, that we see. Beyond this, um, you know, as I think it was John pointed out earlier, all of these economic variables at the individual level are becoming more positive. This is a period between 2012 and 2016 of recovery. So people are actually far more positive by 2016. So even if these things did predict, they would predict in the opposite direction. Uh, they would not predict uh, in the direction of explaining Trump support. Second thing I looked at, and again, I just want to emphasize, it's really hard to say which things are uh, racial status threat versus other kinds of status threat and so forth. But in looking at social dominance orientation, I did two things. First, I looked at the impact of change in social dominance orientation over time. To what extent does a change in SDO predict a change in the likelihood of shifting away from who you voted for in 2012 toward Trump? And then secondly, because so many people have um, offered the thesis that, you know, this was just there all along. It didn't change. All that happened was that Trump really activated it. So it's people who are already high in SDO who would uh, eventually turn out to support Trump four years later. So that's the two estimates you see here. I don't get a significant interaction between SDO and WAVE, meaning the idea that it was there all along um, is not supported and just you know, triggered. But the change in SDO over time, that is people who increase in their levels of social dominance orientation, indicating a sense of threat, were in fact more likely to shift toward a Trump vote. Um, so in this particular case, I don't have a huge number of variables to top this, but in the cross-sectional survey, we also asked a lot of questions about, do you feel like the American way of life is threatened? Um, you know, basically all kinds of things that get at the sort of symbolic feeling of threat but not at anything specific uh, to their personal finances. And again, we find the same overall pattern. Um, people definitely uh, felt that those who felt more threatened were more likely to support Trump, um, but we didn't see much evidence that people with uh, worse financial situations supported Trump. In, in that case, it's just cross-sectional. The other thing that's included in the cross-sectional survey are items uh, similar to some discussed earlier today about to what extent we, people were asked individually how much discrimination is there against blacks, uh, how much discrimination is there against women, how much discrimination against men, how much against Muslims, Christians, and so forth. And what we did was we subtracted the majority group extent of perceived discrimination from the minority or the minority group from the majority group. So what we have is a, an indicator of the extent to which you perceive majority groups as being discriminated against. That was one of the absolute strongest predictors of Trump support uh, in the cross-sectional analysis. So very consistent findings with what we're seeing here. Finally, looking at global status threat, um, in the panel evidence, what I looked at was how change in people's own opinions predicted change in the direction of Trump. And what you see here is basically not a lot of evidence that people's own opinion changes were really what mattered. We do see a significant effect for threat from China. Uh, that does seem to matter in supporting Trump, but it doesn't when you come down to voter preferences among validated voters. So little evidence. However, the change in candidate alignments and how far people were individually from each of these candidates on these issue positions made a huge difference. As you can see, there's very consistent, significant effects in which the perceived distance of yourself from the Democrat uh, makes you more likely to support Trump and vice versa for the perceived distance of the Republican candidate on issues. 
One thing I'll point out is there's lots of reasons to think that people would assimilate the feeling or the perceived issue position of a candidate they like and vice versa. But what's cool about the fixed effects analysis is that given that the person is likely to do that in both waves, not just one, it cancels out in our estimates of effects because whatever type of assimilation or contrast uh, is going on uh, will be present in both waves. So again, what this particular result looks like is it says, you know what, what mattered a lot is not just the public changing, but also the placement of the candidates on these issues relative to one another and relative to American voters. In order to estimate the net change that occurs as a result of uh, change over time in a particular independent variable on change in the dependent variable, we have to take into account not just the coefficients that you saw there, but also the extent to which change happened in that particular direction during this period of time. So this is the combination of the coefficient, how big it is, along with how much people actually change from 2012 to 2014. And what you see is that the biggest impact in terms of uh, issues and so forth uh, comes from the relative distance of the candidates on trade in China in particular. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have predicted that. It does make sense given that most people became more pro-trade and further away from the candidates. There was no relative advantage to Trump gained by virtue of attitudes on immigration policy in particular. The impact of social dominance change over time looks fairly small here, but one of the things I knew from previous research that I had done on things like trade attitudes and attitudes toward China is that social dominance orientation, the need to be on top, the winner, the best, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it predicts attitudes toward those issues, China and trade. And so, Essentially, if you take social dominance out of the model, or sorry, if you take the issue attitudes out of the model, social dominance's effect gets a lot bigger because uh, a lot of it is being absorbed by SDO driving attitudes toward trade where you don't want to be dependent on other nations and so forth and on perceived threat from China in particular. The other thing I want to point out is that a lot of people are still kind of, um, I think, unconvinced because the impact of education was just so, so strong in all of the figures that we saw for Trump voting. And one of the interesting things that you can see here is that the education effect, yes, it's really strong and really significant and so forth. If we include all of the indi economic indicators that we have, it's still really strong and still really significant, as you can see from the green bars. But once you put in the status threat indicators, there is no impact of education. Uh, and what that suggests to me is that status threat is what actually accounts for the impact of education that we saw uh, during the election. Uh, absolutely, we get the same pattern in our data as others did in theirs with respect to education, but once you take out status threat, whether in the panel analysis or in the um, cross-sectional one, the impact of education disappears completely. Okay, just to summarize, in terms of empirical findings, what I think is most important here is that the standard line we get about the election is still in need of some support. I, I'm not saying it's not out there, but I have not seen it yet, and I've looked pretty hard. Uh, we don't see people's personal financial situations as driving a shift toward Trump support. Um, if they were already Republicans, already had certain attitudes, they were already explained in this model because chances were they were going to vote for the Republican candidate regardless. But if for those who switched, and it's admittedly a small portion, um, this was not the driver of that particular attitude change. Instead, what I find is that Trump's support is driven by a, a sense of threat either to people's domestic social status uh, or the global status as the country as a whole. And what I suspect is the anxiety of that kind of status threat kind of builds on one another because these things are both going on at the same time. Uh, and they're both big sources of change for our country. Obviously, people's opinions did shift for some of these issues, but the real driver of support for Trump here was the shift 
in where he positioned himself on issues like trade and China. So it's not so much massive change in public opinion as is massive change in where the two major party candidates are positioning themselves with respect to these issues. And then finally, what I think is interesting about all this is that, you know, viewed through this lens, you'd say that the election was not about downtrodden groups trying to assert their right to better treatment in the United States and more equal life conditions relative to these high status groups. Um, instead, it's an effort by already dominant groups right now to assure their continued uh, high status. And obviously for people in an extremely powerful country also to try to assure its continued dominance along the same lines. So the candidate preferences uh, reflected anxiety about what might happen down the road among these high status groups a lot more than it was complaints about past treatment among low status groups in particular. Uh, the other thing that's worth noting that comes out of this is that uh, it's probably one of the first elections where it's been easy to see that the issues like trade or like our relationship with China um, have an actual electoral impact. In the past, I think uh, most candidates who mentioned these issues at all, all uh, were against him. <laughs> They're both Obama, for example, as well as Romney ran trade bashing and China bashing ads in 2012. Um, generally, these were issues used by candidates for electoral advantage. So there really hasn't been much opinion leadership or anyone willing to speak out in terms of this being a partisan issue. Nonetheless, in 2016, it clearly was a partisan issue. Interestingly, I've looked back over Republicans and Democrats back to 2000, and actually Democrats have been much higher in support of trade and globalization going clear back to 2000 at least. So this is not something new that just changed with Trump. It's been around for quite some time, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that, but um, the Republican Party is obviously no longer the party of free trade, but the interesting thing is it hasn't been for a long time. Uh, and Trump may have figured that out. I think that's everything. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'll keep my comments pretty brief. Uh, I thought that the paper was uh, really clear and sort of motivated a lot of my thinking about what happened from that election. Um, uh, I think one of the main contributions is uh, this change in thought away from thinking about, you know, it's all the economy stupid um, and focusing on a time for change and instead maybe focusing on a, uh, a time for sort of recovering uh, group identities. Um, I just have a couple thoughts about the paper. Um, after I was reading it, I was, uh, you mentioned in the conclusion uh, how this ties in with making America great again. And I have a couple of Trump supporter friends and I've asked them, well, what is making America great again? They could give the answer of, well, you know, it's going back to an economic time. They certainly could answer that way. Um, but perhaps that they would bring up um, more, more group identity answers instead. Um, so I just wonder if there's ever been survey data or anything related to asking Trump supporters precisely what Make America Great Again is, because that would be a really good check in the paper. Um, that goes along the other side. Um, other comments as well, such as uh, Trump saying, you know, we need to build walls as sort of protecting our uh, national group identity. Um, locking her up is sort of an idea of uh, restorative justice, right? Um, I think that there's a lot of slogans um, with the Trump campaign that tie in with this theory. Uh, two other comments. Uh, one of them is just sort of an afterthought after the paper, is that there's this really odd paradox with uh, Trump supporters uh, claiming it's the Democrats that have this sort of social identity conundrum of, well, you know, they're snowflakes and, you know, this is their identity that they need to maintain. Um, that's a really weird paradox, and I wonder if there's something about their own group insecurities which allow them to message that latter point. And then also, um, I just wonder more normatively, like, how are we supposed to communicate with uh, groups that have such a strong group identity uh, uh, aspect to them. Um, I don't know what to take from this going forward of how I talk to my Trump friends, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Um, 
All right, then, uh, our final paper of the day is from Ethan Porter and Tom Wood, and I will turn the floor over to him. Oh, there it was. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, Herb and Tom, for organizing. Um, I think it's been a, a great conference so far, a great selection of papers, um, where we've really sort of plumbed the depths of, of deep theories that might explain uh, the outcome of the 2016 election, which I think we all agree is rather puzzling. Um, and to sort of conclude the day and be the last paper, I'm going to propose a more parsimonious uh, <laughs> hypothesis that uh, possibly, maybe, uh, John Stewart elected Donald Trump. Um, and and I, I think I'm also going to speak to some of these sort of higher order theory concerns, um, but uh, I'm also going to sort of tell you that it's possible that indeed uh, John Stewart wielded an outsized role on the 2016 electoral outcome. What does this mean? I'll sort of walk you through it. So first of all, um, uh, stepping back for a second, we, we talked about partisan political media. Um, there's good reason to think that especially in 2016, but even before that, that any one sort of show or any one kind of, or one sort of instance of partisan media is going to be able to have an effect, right? We live in an age of intense polarization and intense self-selection, right? Um, people uh, choose what they want to watch, and they do so based on their own partisan predispositions. Um, and it seems, you know, with this in mind, it seems really hard to imagine that any one show or any one um, you know, a particular kind of media is going to break through and actually uh, have an impact on electoral outcomes. Um, so we're going to look at whether or not this is possible by leveraging host replacements at two of Comedy Central's flagship shows, uh, The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. Uh, rapport with no T, as, as you may know. Um, and then we're going to look at the subsequent decline in ratings. Um, we're going to map this decline onto 2016 vote share. Um, and we're going to define that the ratings decline for the Daily Show specifically increase county level Republican vote share by 1.1% from 2012 to 2016. Um, we also find small but significant conservatizing effects on social attitudes. So that's sort of the spoiler alert of this, of this talk that I'm about to give you. And uh, this is sort of what's to come. Um, let me, you know, there, there's some actual significant theoretical stakes here, in addition, of course, to the major stake of, you know, who's going to win an election. Um, so first, there's a large literature on the effects of The Daily Show, which I recommend reading um, if you ever watch The Daily Show, because, you know, The Daily Show is fun, and it's fun to read about The Daily Show. Um, so, uh, you know, in a lot of this literature is what you might expect, right? It finds that The Daily Show has a large um, pro-democratic, uh, pro anti-republican bias. Um, it, that it results in a more informed, albeit slightly more cynical and skeptical citizenry. Um, there's a great paper um, uh, by Parkin, and I think in POQ, which looks at John Kerry's 2004 appearance on The Daily Show uh, during his presidential campaign. Um, and Parkin finds that it was especially impactful among otherwise unengaged voters. Does anyone here remember John Kerry's appearance on The 2004 Daily Show? I remember, I actually thought it was extremely awkward. Um, right, uh, he used the phrase "would that it were" several times, um, <laughs> which is like, wow, you are really uh, you know, more elite than I am. I didn't know that was a phrase before I saw, or I heard John Kerry use it. Um, but uh, according to Parkin, you know, this had this sort of humanizing effect. Right, among young voters who watched the Daily Show, they said, okay, John Kerry seems more normal than we thought. Right. There's also robust literature on the causal effects of media, which should be familiar to many people in this room. Um, Matt Jenskow has been mentioned a lot um, in, this, in this conference so far, but also there's a great paper uh, by Kerrion Levine in the AER in 2016, which is about uh, MTV's 16 and Pregnant. Um, and uh, Kerrion Levine conclude that MTV's 16 and Pregnant actually led to a decrease in uh, teen pregnancy rates, which again, not so surprising if you ever watch 16 and Pregnant. Um, there's also a, a great paper, you know, but there's sort of this broader question that I want to you know, bring to the fore, which is about media effects in general, right? Um, there's, a, there's a paper that I want to commend by Diana in, the, in Dentalist in 2012, where she sort of walks through um, the media effects uh, literature uh, debates, um, which undergrads actually read this paper, so for that reason alone, I recommend it. Um, and, you know, in, in general, scholars are skeptical that me media is going to be able to have an effect on, you know, meaningful on, you know, con you know it's going to have political consequences. 
But there is a sort of emerging literature about the robust effects of Fox News, right? So Della Vigna, Della Vigna and Kaplan about 10 years ago found that uh, exposure to Fox News led to small but you know, significant increases in Republican vote share. There's a new paper, again out of the AAR, which is, is very much like the old paper by Martin and Yura Kublo, uh, where they again conclude that you know, they're, they're using uh, channel placement as the instrument. They're again concluding that there's some significant effect of um, uh, exposure to Fox News on Republican vote share, right? So in general, people think The Daily Show is an interesting um, you know, area of inquiry. There's reason to believe though in, that uh, media effects probably small, but maybe uh, certain kinds of media can break through, right? Um, so could The Daily Show do that? Could The Daily Show actually move uh, behaviors and attitudes? Um, and I think now that Stewart is off the air, we've sort of forgotten about what he was and what he was capable of at his height. Um, so this is uh, the, the, the Rally to Restore Sanity, uh, which, I, which I found yesterday Chris Jelty was at. Um, I was at as well. Um, so this is a rally on the Washington, on the National Mall, that attracted hundreds of thousands of people, that at least by one estimate, attracted more people than Donald Trump's inauguration, right? Okay, I know. I know, I know. Yes. Yeah, right. This actually makes it look very small, right? Uh, you can see me right there. Uh, no, you can't. But uh, there are lots and lots of people there. Um, and this is, you know, this is unusual for a for a political, you know, television commentator to be able to actually draw a really large crowd to DC uh, and, uh, you know, with Stephen Colbert as well. Um, so again, you know, we sort of forget about this now. But at his height, uh, Stewart was a was a pretty uh, pretty powerful guy. Um, now, convenient for us as researchers, uh, Stewart and Colbert both went off the air at around the same time, though not exactly the same time, during the 2016 election, electoral process, right? So on the top, you're looking at uh, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, right? Where Stewart is on the air until sort of near the end of 2016. He went off, the, I think, the fall of 2015. That's September. He goes off the air. Um, there's then a period of uh, the running reruns, and then The Daily Show debuts with Trevor Noah. Uh, Colbert had already been off the air for some time. Again, there's a period of reruns. And then they just scrapped the Colbert format, and they replace uh, Colbert with the nightly show with Larry Wilmore. Um, now, I know there are people who are fans of Trevor Noah, and there are people who are fans of Larry Wilmore. But suffice it to say, neither of them uh, has been, or in uh, Wilmore's case, was as popular uh, as their predecessor, right? So. Uh, Look at some ratings, right? So here we're looking at the on the left hand side we're looking at the Stuart Noah ratings, um, and again we're just we're just zero we're just xing out the uh, you know the handoff period where they just play reruns, and you see a, a pretty significant drop off, right? John Stewart goes off the air, he's replaced by Trevor Noah, and people don't find uh, Trevor Noah as funny, or they don't like Trevor Noah as much, or whatever it doesn't actually matter. They just stop watching him as much. Right? Um, the Colbert Wilmore story is similar, right? There's a period where you know they just show Colbert reruns, and then they go to the Wilmore show, and again, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, ratings decline. Right? So What's the subhead say? Each something is a separate Each year is a separate state market intersection, and then the ratings are smooth for 16 day periods. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, any other if size stops whispering, you have to stop. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Well, <laughs> I know. Um, so again, we're looking at you know two um, very popular shows. One of which was extraordinarily popular and politically powerful. The other, which was sort of you know you know Colbert was there as well at, at the rally for sanity, um, and you know also a popular guy. Um, so the reason we can we can do this uh, this study is because we happen to get our hands on a large amount of data uh, of ratings data, uh, you know, the granular county level ratings data, right? Um, so this is gonna allow us to do a difference in difference design. We're gonna regress the differential performance of the GOP presidential county vote share from, 26, from 2012 to 2016 on the ratings difference for both TV shows in those counties, right? So it's a difference in difference in design, which we're also gonna try and minimize some omitted variable bias by including ratings changes for other comedy central shows at this time, right? Because the concern you might be having at this point would go something like, well, if you find an effect, it's actually probably related to sort of broader audience patterns, right? People, you know, when Jon Stewart goes off the air, people stop watching Comedy Central, right? Which, you know, might be the case. Unfortunately, um, we have ratings data for the other Comedy Central shows as well, which we can include in our models, right? 
So here's sort of the big result. On the left-hand side, you're looking at the effect of the Trump vote share to the Romney vote share at the county level from the, what we call, you know, the dependent variable is the NOAA, is the, you know, the, is, is, that's the NOAA handoff model, right? So that we're looking just at the NOAA, the NOAA handoff. We're seeing the decline in NOAA audience, right? We're claiming led to a 1.1% increase in Republican vote share from 2016 compared to 2012, right? Um, now, Again, this is, you know, we're, we're able to sort of measure this at the county level because we have the ratings data at that level. You also see lots of other significant predictors which shouldn't be surprising to you at all. What's interesting about, about this model, well, first of all, I think the fact that the decline in the NOAA audience is a significant predictor of a positive increase in support for the GOP candidate is also the, the fact that we got the controls going in, um, Comedy Central controls, which are ratings for other Comedy Central shows during this time period, and they're not significant. Right? They're not popping out, which is what we, frankly, would expect if um, you know this is we're just picking up on some broader story about Comedy Central's popularity. Hey, yeah. How many counties are being dropped here? Um, 1790 is that's lower than the number of counties in the United States, right? Yeah, quite oh, a bit. Just 3,200. Yeah. yeah. We had a ratings data for uh, about um, what's it, 32 states. Okay. Yeah. Is that, is that missing data a problem? Yeah. No, the states are no more, like, they are no more politically marginal, and there's no difference in the Trump percentage between the states and the six states. I'm sure that's not the counties without a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's always a problem, right? Um, so the right-hand side, uh, the Wilmore handoff, uh, again, you know, we don't see anything significant pop off, right? Which, again, you know, might be uh, a question of, you know, it might be a question of sample size, but I think it also sort of squares with our own intuitions and sort of the history of both shows, right? Um, well, so think back to what The Daily Show was, right? For half an hour every night, John Stewart, a skilled political communicator, was in people's homes, millions of people's homes, talking to them in a way that was favorable toward the Democratic Party, critical of the Republican Party, and favorable and critical of their respective politicians, right? Um, so we talk a lot about, you know, well, you know, in, in a lot of priming studies and a lot of media effects studies, we're looking at the effect of one show, right, or one episode of one show, right? We're, we're, you got to think sort of about cumulative effects here, right? And it, it seems to me that there's probably a cumulative effect story going on. Um, where over time people are deprived of access to the partisan media that Donald, uh, that John Stewart was, um, you know, was disseminated. Um, think also back to that Parkin paper, right, where he's able to say, look, during the 2004 election, John Kerry goes, leverages The Daily Show, and voila, he's a little more liked by people who are otherwise impressionable or disengaged, right? Uh, there is no opportunity for Hillary Clinton to, uh, to avail herself of something similar during the 2016 electoral process, right? In some counterfactual world, it might have been the case that, you know, were Jon Stewart still on the air, she would have gone on and, you know, she would have humanized herself in ways that, you know, she was not able to do because he's no longer on the air. And not only is he no longer on the air, but his replacement is simply being watched by far fewer people, right? So now the big question, of course, is let's, you know, let's, let's assume that we buy this, right? Um, let's assume that we buy this estimate. Um, then what is the sort of overall effect on uh, sort of the electoral college outcome. Um, so here we're going to just take, um, we're going to do several sets of electoral college simulations um, where we're going to take, again, just for the counties that we have data on, and we're just going to change just the, just the coefficient for the ratings decline, right? So in the, the middle panel is just the observed decline and NOAA handoff. That means basically for 55% of the time, um, Hillary Clinton is winning the election. Um, right. In, in, again, if we're, if we're just if we're just keeping if we're just aggregating up from the county to the state level, um, the right hand side we're looking at a four times observed decline in NOAA handoff. Again, we're aggregating up from the county level to the states, and we're seeing a much larger uh, you know a much larger number of simulations. Donald Trump is prevailing. On the left hand side, um, there's no decline in NOAA handoff. Right. Maybe it's the case that John Stewart remained on the air. You know, you can imagine lots of counterfactuals. Um, and Hillary Clinton is prevailing most of the time. Um, so again, this is, you know, again, these are simulations. This is suggestive evidence that were Donald Trump, uh, you know, to have sort of been running when Jon Stewart is on the air, the election might have turned out differently. 
Um, again, this is only suggestive, right? We're just using a you know, straightforward diff and diff model to give a sense, you know, to reduce omitted variable bias, but we haven't eliminated by any chance, although I do think the addition of the comedy central controls um, does a bit of work. Um, but now the question becomes, okay, like, why should I buy this, right? Like, if it's the case that Donald Trump is actually benefiting by 1.1% compared to Romney four years ago, like, because of the Daily Show, like, why is that? And, again, you know, sort of refresh your memory, right? Uh, and, and it's, it's a, uh, Stewart is a, you know, a, a very effective spokesman for democratic issues and causes. Um, So we're going to investigate also uh, to see whether or not um, that the ratings decline had effects on public opinion, right? So if it's the case that the ratings declines had some effects or appear to have, some, have had some effects on vote share, it also would seem to be the case that possibly there'd be some effect on public opinion, right? Because deprived of you know, the reliably pro-democratic communicator, people's political views are going to become um, less you know, friendly to Democrats. So to study this, we're going to take Comedy Central ratings data again from Comscore, um, which you know, which is which is cool because it's all platforms too, which is why this data is, I think, so rich. Um, then we're going to take CCS data, um, where we've got individual level data for lots and lots of people, and then we're going to divide the ratings between hosts with the ratings difference serving as the key independent variable. Then we're going to add in all the plausible county level uh, and individual level covariates we can think of. Um, and again, we're trying to reduce omitted variable bias here, um, but you know, we, we, cer we certainly don't claim to have eliminated the problem altogether. Um, so here's a plot with a lot going on, or a figure with a lot going on, really. Um, and on the sort of top three facets, you're looking at um, you're looking at a, a, you know probability of agreement with a particular CCS issue, right? And there's a lot of, this, there is noise in this data. And by noise, I mean for some of the Stewart uh, replacement effect, you're looking at a conservatizing effect. For others, you're looking at a liberalizing effect. I think the most interesting one, let's see if I can, is, is right here, abortion, right? So we look at the Stewart Noah, the Stewart Noah, de the Stewart Noah decline. Um, people more likely to agree that abortion should be illegal, less likely to agree that abortion should be available uh, at a woman's choice, right? Um, now, again, there are sort of, I, I, you know, I, I'm sort of telling you to look at that in part like a magician, right? Because there's a lot else going on here, which is not as clear. Um, I think the big takeaway should be, though, that like, there's some evidence that there was a conservatizing effect on key public opinion issues, right? I think that's sort of what we believe at this point. Um, on the bottom, we're going to look at life events, right? Because if you believe the Kearney and Levine story, um, lots of life events, or maybe some life events, should also be affected. Um, in, we find very, very little evidence that any life events were affected by uh, these declines, which to us suggests that you know maybe maybe we should think of these as a placebo, right? Which is to say, you know, if, if these were more media, if these had been affected, we'd be a little more worried um, about the claims that we're making. Um, so what's the big conclusion? Um, ratings decline in small but significant relationship with social attitudes, um, largely but not entirely a conservatizing relationship. And this is sort of the big headline finding, is that the best available data that we have and that we've seen is that the, the Daily Show seems to have, you know, the ratings decline seems to have been associated with a 1.1% increase in the Republican vote share at the county level, right? Which you may or may not believe is a byproduct of the conservatizing effect of not having Stewart on air anymore. Um, so, you know, Dillapain shows that exposure to co-partisan media uh, can mobilize voters, right? This is a clear point. The opposite also appears to be true, right? If exposure to co-partisan media can mobilize you, it seems eminently possible that lack of exposure to co-partisan media can demobilize you, right? So it may very well be the case that without that sort of reaffirming John Stewart uh, in your ear and in front of your face every night for half an hour, you're going to be less likely to turn out for his preferred team. Um, as exposure to Fox News can increase Republican vote share, so can lack of exposure to The Daily Show. Um, oh, this is sort of my favorite set of quotes. Uh, John Stewart has constantly uh, denigrated his own audience and his own importance. Um, whether or not he's being sincere or ironic in these denigrations is up for debate. Um, he's asked on a scale of 0 to 10, I'd go with a 0, not very important. 
right? So he's not using a Likert scale, but he's you know, using this sort of well-known scale and saying, I don't think my show matters at all. Um, he also described his audience members as mostly stoned, um, <laughs> right? Um, and so it turns out, though, that whether they're stoned or not, they still might have been impactful, right? He was wrong, right? John Stewart, smart guy, unless he's being ironic here, if he's, this is a sincere expression of his belief, seems to be incorrect. Um, I think there's good evidence to, to believe, and I believe Tom does as well, uh, that uh, he had a strong, albeit not implausibly strong, or implausibly large effect in the 2016 election. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the randomization gods for allowing me to be discussed twice in a row. Um, so I don't think I've ever had an article that cued so much uh, skepticism from a title as this one did. Um, but going into it, uh, I think that the evidence that's sort of marshaled out in this paper is pretty persuasive. Um, one thing that I'd like to consider with the theory is um, some work from uh, prior, which is that uh, political entertainment sort of helps the medicine go down um, with respect to political information. So it's not unthinkable that um, the loss of John Stewart, so to speak, uh, uh, leads to these effects. I, I kind of buy the theory after thinking about it uh, beyond the title. Uh, some things going forward and some things I've thought about is how different um, political entertainment and political comedy shows relate with this. Um, I think that these things in spark emotions. Um, I cried when Letterman left. Um, I, I danced when Leno left. Uh, <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, and perhaps how um, these effects tie in with other media modalities, right? So John Stewart didn't really die. He, he appeared on uh, uh, Colbert later on. Uh, he, he exists on other social media platforms and online. Um, and I wonder if these effects uh, could be baked into the paper somewhere um, as well. But, um, yeah, beyond that, I thought it was just a really good paper and very challenging uh, beyond the title. So, thank you. Well, I just think you're totally right to gloss on it. We try to bring it into the paper and in the presentation, but there is this way in which simply by being funny and insincere and comedic, Stewart is able to, you know, make people pay attention to politics in a way that uh, other political media and political messaging does not. Uh, I am going to abuse my position as as chair here just a little bit to ask the first question. It's the smallest amount of power that's ever gone to someone's head. <laughs> uh, one thing that actually struck me, and one thing that I think might help me buy the idea that John Stewart swung the election a little bit, is if you guys looked at maybe uh, the interaction of some of the, the demographics at the county level, as particularly race, right? Um, and especially thinking about some of Diana's work on social dominance, you can imagine this world where uh, potentially, or a, a high racial resentment person watches his favorite comedy block go from two white guys to a uh, black guy and a South African immigrant, yeah. and it suddenly perceives a ton of threat because of that. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, the, other, the other one that I, that I think we still need to investigate, too, is whether or not uh, like proximity to a college town, right, where we assume that Stewart mm -hmm. is not only being watched a lot, but is being watched in dorm rooms, where this kind of sort of incidental exposure to democratic messaging uh, might have been more. So I think college and, and race would be, yeah, those, those are great. Thank you. If I can add, I was yeah. going to say, Stuart made those kinds of comments all the time about his show not mattering right. and, you know. But part of that was a backlash because he started criticizing so-called real political shows. Right. Like Tucker Carlson and so forth. And he was then criticized for, you know, not upholding journalistic standards. And his rebuttal to that was always, come on, we're a comedy show, we're not a news program. And so in some ways that was a, you know, uh, protective shield for him so he could he could do things other people couldn't right so I would also speculate that that sort of operates to his benefit in the same way that Donald Trump's protestations that he's not a politician benefit right mm -hmm. it insulates him and allows him to make claims and be effective in ways that traditional media figures are not mm -hmm. effective on so politics. I'm not sure it is disingenuous <laughs> I, I, yeah all right uh, John Uh, yes. Where's the, uh... Oh. Yeah. 
<laughs> the magic wand. <laughs> say two things. I would say, I, you know, we could have done the sneaky thing and only showed you the the uh, steward effects, but I that would have been dishonest, I, right? So honesty, we're, we're putting really our warts out here, right? The messiness is truthful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, like, I, I do think there's a, there's, a, there's a sense in which the CCS data might be sort of distracting, right? Like, I actually believe the, the, the Stewart results independent of what the CCS says, right? Like, like, I think the CCS might sort of help lay out the case, but ultimately, like, the CCS data is not capturing, you know, some, like, general affinity toward Hillary Clinton, or, you know, or, or lack thereof come election season compared to affinity for Obama, you know, in 2012, right? Like, that, that can't be captured by this, right? To assume this matters, you have to assume that, you know, issue voting matters, which, I don't. I don't really know if I believe that at all. Right? Was there? Um, did the CCES in 2016 have any panel component with the earlier? You know, they built that 10, 12, 14 panel. Did they didn't? I don't think so. 16. Well, I know there are YouGov respondents in both sets of data. Uh -huh. YouGov only has so many people that will take your service. <laughs> but you know, um, but it would be. Seems like to me what would really be amazing yeah. would be to not. You know, to think about like the uh, an election specific dependent variable like Hillary Clinton dealing with monitor. Sure. Or, or you know, something that we could you could identify was related to to judge to, yeah. And I would really nail it. And and I, I it's not as if I'm telling you something that you guys haven't thought of, but yeah. like, just you know, just articulating what makes what would help my priors a little bit, you know. Right. So right. in terms of a direction to go, I, we should talk more. Maybe we can sort of leverage this out of some other data that okay. I have. Maybe um, you guys have the good sense to ask about Comedy Central <laughs> in some like early, early, early wave and now like lurking in this data. We ask about programs, but not about whole networks. Um, well, did you ask about you could extrapolate? Yeah, right? yeah. Oh. No. We ask about a lot of programs. Okay. Yeah, and our, mm -hmm. I told Ethan the 2011 baseline wave of the CCAP has pretty sure that the comments are going to be but I have to double check. Okay, cool. I don't know. Uh, we got two questions on this side. Hi, so I have a, uh, a brief background in political entertainment research, so I am leaning towards buying your argument. Um, but what I think is a big um, block in terms of situating your argument and saying that it is the Daily Show's influence is um, a lack of information about last week tonight. Uh, and the reason that I think that that's such a um, 
such an absence here in this paper is that research is now coming out about the last about last week tonight. So Amy Becker did a piece, um, a content analysis, and found that last week tonight's content covered just as much informative um, political information as nightly news. So in that sense, it's just as informative. Its ratings have been growing. Um, and I did, I mean, it's an undergraduate thesis, so as much as it can be reliable, um, I did a content analysis finding that um, Stewart of the, or, uh, Oliver, of the 24 episodes that I analyzed over season one and season two, he made 17 calls to action. So much like Stewart made that call to action of having that um, organization of the rally to restore sanity and or fear, um, St uh, Oliver did similar actions. So while you may not find a handoff in The Daily Show um, or The Colbert Report in Comedy Central, you might see a handoff with Last Week Tonight. Um, so I don't know if you have data on that, but I definitely would consider that for your analysis. Um, and I don't know if that's ever crossed your path um, or if you wanted to keep specifically to Comedy Central. Uh, I, I, I love the show. I think that the difference, though, here for, from a theoretical perspective is that Last Week Tonight only airs one night a week, right? So there's a dosage mm -hmm. difference. Like, this is, to me, why I actually sort of, uh, I'm sort of with you for the most part. We're like, I mostly buy this. And the reason I mostly buy it is because of repeated exposure, right? Whereas, like, mm -hmm. you have to know to turn on the TV or to, you know, order your on-demand once a week dosage of John Oliver. So I would actually expect that the sort of, the, the sort of effects are, are probably smaller. Um, uh, well, she kind of got to what I was going to ask, but I would even take it further. Um, so since since um, uh, John Stewart got off the air, it hasn't just been uh, uh, Larry Wilmore and Trevor Noah and even John Oliver. You've had also Samantha Beeve uh, has so had even since then. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel starting to move in a more explicitly political direction. So I'm wondering if maybe just this abundance of uh, liberal skewing comedic shows might be almost fracturing that audience and if that might have anything to do with, you see what I mean? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would love to uh, pitch Tom on this many times. We need to do a study on the Kimmel effect. I think that's been major. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the fracturing uh, has been going on for a long time, right? Uh, there's one version of this paper where we sort of show over time, you know, political TV used to be two or three channels, and over time it's on lots of channels and lots of options. Um, I think, though, The Daily Show sort of still stands out, right, um, despite that, you know, long-term fracture. So just to uh, back up on the, the last week is that it's not just the people are tuning in to Comedy Central every night to watch John Stewart, it's that the John Stewart clips were then a big part of the little sort of long line yeah. ecosystem with Slate and Salon and every blog and like three Daily Coast uh, pages would then <coughs> repost the, the, the John Stewart clip from the night before. And even if you didn't tune in at 11, if you've gone to bed by then, you still get exposed to those things. That's one of the reasons why I buy the John Stewart had bigger effect than, say, John Oliver, because you can only do that once a week for John Oliver. One thing we were back up to the um, county level analysis. I, I guess I wonder if that's a Mitt score. Yeah, if what's a Mitt score? The, the sharing of the. Not the, the sharing. Case. Okay. Um, but on the county level, one thing I was, I don't know if I just missed it or if it's not in there, um, is the age of the average age in the county from 2012 to 2016 and if that changes. Because one of the things that I, that I just imagine is that they was just got a younger audience and if people are. In, you know, in 2012, watching Daily Show in one county, and then they move hmm. to a county that may, maybe maintains higher Comedy Central ratings, and then the counties then become more conservative as a result. That could be uh, compounding. It's, it's not in there. It's not in there. It's a good idea. Okay. All right. Um, so I have a question. Does your data, or can you get the data on when there was, you know, how long it was when? Stewart left for a while to make his movie, and it was John Oliver taking it um, over for a little while. Because um, if, if you don't have that, you could get that. You could look at that, see if you find, like, I'd be curious to see if you find some more drop offs. I mean, you would probably find some, I mean, not the same magnitude. And also try to leverage that to look at perhaps county differences within something else, and I think that would also probably help your story. Um, and then also, kind of as a, as a question to perhaps the bigger picture of this, and I'm sorry that I'm like the 18th person talking about uh, uh, 
ones do. Um, you know, so so I at least view this stuff being big in like a 2008, 2012 political environment. In, and this was something that was, uh, I'd say, very engaging. Like, we have this big, you know, this big rally in DC, everyone goes to this. And I can't think of something on the other side of the aisle um, that perhaps had that same level of engagement. Whereas, do we see that perhaps on the right and you know, the Trump side now or during the 2016 election? Like, I my, my mind immediately goes to uh, the Donald. If you don't know what that is, like, you don't want to know. Um, and, like, that there is this, like, engaging environment, like that in Breitbart for the right that didn't exist before. And do we think that some of these effects are, there is perhaps a mirror of what that was now that they're going to be well, um, Yiannopoulos, Ben Shapiro, sorry. Well, <laughs> the reality is for sanity itself modeled after a black back rally. Uh, uh, the mm. Yeah, they're all, I, I thought it might have been the other way around. I don't know, they all seem to be imitating and copying each other. Um, you know, what's interesting though is that usually when we talk about media effects, we say, well, you know, this was so effective, so huge. It's like, well, if that's true, then it might also be the case that there's some, you know, you know, effect of the drop off, which I think we're really looking at specifically. So I had a number of thoughts um, with an eye towards trying to assuage the skeptic to my left who just left. Um, <laughs> so we don't have to assuage him anymore. <laughs> um, I'm still a skeptic. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so yeah, you can consider this. So. Yeah. Um, so one thing is, could you do placebo tests with the county level data? So for instance, just pipe in the change from 2008 to 2012, yeah, 2004 to 2008, we have to and show, because I, I think there's even, so you have some number of independent variables, but you don't have age, as, as was mentioned, and um, it could be any functional form of these things. Right. The, we mentioned college towns. That relates to another point, which is the fact that I'd be curious to hear more about your audience data insofar as a lot of this audience data is itself modeled. So, you know, Nielsen doesn't have that many people. They then model using demographics. So you may have a lot, that this may already be some demographic transformation of the data, basically. You right. may have a lot less independent information than, than you think you do. Um, the, I think matching might be appropriate here, just in that there are a bunch of counties where probably John Stewart viewership is really low. Yeah. And, you know, most counties in the U.S. are really pretty small right. and so you may well want to um, to have an estimator that's going to get rid of counties where there are 2,000 people and eight of them are watching John Stewart. Um, if there are any opportunities, so one related question then is it sounds like your story is more going to influence election outcomes through turnout than through persuasion, right? right? Because it's more that your people are not going to be mobilized than that they're actually going to Oh, now that John Stewart's, you know, I used to love him, but now that he's gone, right. Trump seems tempting. Um, <laughs> that, so I think showing, if you were to show that, it, that this is about turnout, and then it's not, and it's about turnout in the demographics that you expect it to be, yeah. that also would be persuasive. Okay, thank you. We were already pursuing the voter pilots. Oh, yeah. I've got a question. I have a lot of yeah, given, oh. given that age has been raised as a variable, some of us have been noticing the people asking the questions are about at least half my age. <laughs> and I think there's a reason for that. Uh, but are there any questions of Diana? <laughs> Rick looks like he's really eager. Diana, I come away with a pretty pessimistic view of what's going on here. Because I think that status is eroding, mm -hmm. and reality of globalization is going to make a more multicultural country, and China and Russia and Europe are going to be uh, rising in my view. I don't think we can reverse those trends. Particularly. Then uh, John Stewart aside, there are big <laughs> macro level conceptions of the country that are very different here. I, I mean, I'm partly I see you running with what John Sive was talking about this morning about white consciousness. I think it was deeper. People who should feel, uh, because that question about China doesn't just go to white Christians. It goes to how you feel about America. Mm -hmm. right. It's after all, make America great again. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that people have different conceptions of what this country should be, who should be a member in it, whether it's okay that it's a multicultural society or not. Europe's going through much the same kind of discussion. 
And those are big social questions. It seems to uh, make the future elections not a matter of a TV comedy show, but a really uh, tough value-based fight in America Over with who we this are. highly privileged yeah. group uh, maybe getting mobilized to protect itself. Right. I would just say that we had these same debates in the mid-90s with Japan. Mm -hmm. Immigration was a huge issue. You know, Perot was always talking about the loss of U.S. status in the world. So this has happened before, and it went away for a while. And yeah, I don't think some of this is going away. I agree with Rick on that front. That is globalization, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And the shift toward a more multicultural America is going to happen. Um, it already has to some extent. So I do agree with you on that. That is, um, that I can see interpreting as pessimistic because I, I don't think you're going to reverse these things. Uh, but on the other hand, I will tell you that we're, the way that we're talking about their um, sense of threat is as if it's, based on calculations, uh, you know, that it's a rational kind of thing that they're responding to. And one of the things that I think is strangely <laughs> reassuring is that since Trump was elected, um, we have another wave of panel data, all the threat indicators are way down. Um, and so by virtue of Trump winning, I think even though, you know, these particular things aren't different, uh, they feel less like they have no um, say. They're, you know, being overpowered by minorities and women and foreigners and so forth. Um, I think the kind of threat that Wendy mentions, like Japan, we all, you know, back in in that period of time in the 80s, everybody hated Japan. But the difference, I think, is that that was the very beginning of the move toward a far more global economy. And it's gone much further now. And I don't think that, um, for example, the anti-trade attitudes, they are all about threat. If you look now at trade attitudes in the United States, since Trump was elected, they've gone up, up, up. Um, we have the highest level of free trade support, ironically, that we've had since the 1990s when the Chicago Council started measuring them right now. And that's bizarre. And that's obviously not opinion leadership on his part. Um, but what it is is the sense of threat that makes people hunker down and want to keep everybody out. And it prompts this kind of nostalgia for the past that's very strong. And one of the things from some of the experimental work um, I've seen is it's it's so inconsistent, and yet it's very much there. Like you show people an uh, article that actually did appear on the front page of the New York Times about a guy who lost his job. You know, sad story, he can't provide for his family, blah, 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 the usual story we've seen. Well, all we did was change a few words in it to say that he lost his job due to trade versus losing his job due to automation. If he lost his job due to trade, people are far more anti-Chinese uh, Americans, anti-outgroup, you know, basically very resentful, very angry. People who got, uh, the, he lost his job, which is still, you know, unpleasant due to automation, none of that animosity, none of that opposition and hunkering down kind of attitude comes out of that. And of course what we know is actually most of those manufacturing jobs were lost due to automation. But the perception is that it's trade. Strangely, though, we also ask people about, um, you'd call them safety net questions. But for example, you would think that if the Trump supporters really care about the common man who lost his job at the manufacturing plant, they would be in favor of trade adjustment assistance. Um, not in your life. They're strongly against it. So what they want is not help for the common man. They want to go back. We just want those jobs back. We want those manufacturing jobs back here tomorrow. We want to, you know, reverse the clock, essentially. And obviously that's not going to happen. So the problem is how uh, a party, you know, like Republicans, who on one hand um, are, are now very much opposed to trade, are going to ever be able to adjust to that if they're also opposed to help for people who've been displaced by trade. Because, yeah. Your explanation seems counter to your main finding, which is that they're not worried about their particular jobs. Well, they're, they're not. not worried about getting those no, jobs. No, they're worried about other people's. They think this is a, like if you look at that personal effects of trade, nobody, 
It's very few people who think it's affected the family, and it's no more people now than it was Can 10 years ago. They don't want to get those, um, what do you call it, John? Those city slickers like John Stewart and punch him in the face. <laughs> get them, put, put John Kelly or, or General Mattis out there. People they can be proud of because these are strong, powerful Americans. And get rid of these left wings who piss all over America and put America up there in, in the way they've always imagined it is this great, grand thing. And themselves, too, as uh, you know, proud Americans uh, who are the superior class, maybe the superior race for a lot of them. And that it has really yeah, nothing no. to do with, I think your yeah. study shows us it is not the economy stupid. No, it's not. It's these deep things that I think are much uglier. They're much more difficult to uh, get our hand on. And we've got a president now who's putting his hand right on them. I'm just worried that in 2025 we'll have the American Nationalist White Party competing against some other party that's representing the not that. We see it all over the rest of the world where we have ethnically identified parties. We have highly polarized politics around these ethnically identified parties. And countries dissolve in pretty serious problems. And if you're right, and this is a fight over what is America, is it a multicultural and inclusive place, or is, is it not? Uh, we haven't had that debate in a long time because we thought it was one in the favor of the multicultural yeah. inclusion. And you know, Richard Spencer is suing Ohio State to come here and tell us, <laughs> no, it ain't. Yeah. No, and it is, it is very much about that. I have a, a similar study that was done in Canada focusing on trade attitudes. And one of the fascinating things is that the more positively you feel about your country in Canada, the more pro-immigration, the more pro-trade. And it's because of this idea that we stand for multiculturalism. They passed an actual law, the multiculturalism law in the 1980s. In the United States, we don't have a consensus on who we are or what we stand for uh, as a country. And that is what we're seeing going on. However, I don't believe that none of this is malleable. I would say, you know, the idea that, oh, well, it's racism, therefore it's never going to change. It's changing in the sense that we are becoming a majority-minority nation. And that is going to make it harder to sell this kind of version of America as who we are uh, to those people, assuming they vote. So a little bit push back on, on this maybe early question. Um, I'm, I'm nervous about talking about the, this group that's shifting to Trump is highly privileged. Maybe privileged in some dimension, but I, unless I'm missing the basic statistics, Clinton was still winning white college educated voters and she was being destroyed under uh, white non-college educated voters. And I know you're teasing that education from your findings, but I still think that's a basic underlying reality that's important here. Um, also, I, I think, and maybe this is, Rick, there's a little more reason for optimism. It's, you know, m my strong sense of living in Ohio through 2012 and comparing it through 2016 and kind of trying to watch this closely is that, you know, even if it wasn't necessarily China and trade, Obama was able to seem authentic and be believable among that group of voters because he did support the auto bailout and he was not paying capital. So the real decisive issue for the Rust Belt Midwest was this either or choice between Obama versus Romney on, and whether this is fractured through my job or our community and our way of life and make America great. Obama was standing up for what that group needed to hear and Romney wasn't. Fast forward to 2016 and it's a totally different story. Um, Clinton can't stand up for those issues the way Obama can, and obviously Trump is very different uh, from Romney. And so it just seems, again, this, this may be another reminder where, um, you know, again, Clinton won the popular vote, and this, we're talking about small margins. So I don't think it's an apocalyptic moment, at least I, I hope not. And, and so it seems to me there's a more nuanced understanding of it. Well, let me just clarify, because I didn't show the cross-sectional stuff where we do include things like incumbent education and all that. Education, you know, is a massive predictor, unless you take try to figure out what education represents. Because education is correlated with so many variables uh, that we study in political science, particularly outgroup anxiety. Um, it's a major, major uh, relationship between those two variables, and I think that if income predicts it all, it's positively. That is, higher income people supported Trump. If you're talking about income separate 
from education and so forth. So um, part of what I was not as much, I don't know about Romney cross-sectionally, I'd have to look at that, but I think it hmm. is the case that you don't, for example, it's not people in areas dominated by manufacturing, it's people who care about that, and this yeah, is the thing. Hunter has, has a paper looking at Chinese import competition and true yeah, vote share. I know that paper, but actually I don't buy that paper, nor do the IR people in my department for a couple reasons. It's not, if you look at who is actually losing jobs, who is, it's not, again, in manufacturing right now, because manufacturing went up in the last 10 years. So what's happening that's different now is that people are, in fact, responding very negatively, first of all, to being out of power for two rounds for the Republicans. I think that does make the reaction a lot more intense. But it's also true that if you, I, I think this is intuitively true, if you look at what coverage of things like these issues are, are trade, job loss, et cetera, the left behind, anybody with an ounce of empathy would be against those things, you know, because they're gut-wrenching stories. And what's fascinating is that if you look at that versus, let's say, immigration, what are the gut-wrenching stories we've seen in the last four years about immigration? They favor the poor immigrants, right? There are people sinking on boats and having horrible things happen, happen to them. When you look at positive coverage, which is virtually none of, um, on job creation through export markets and so on and so forth, there are statistical presentations. They're not things where empathy drives people um, to care about these groups. But it's, it's just like it is with healthcare. You don't have to be among the uninsured to feel like, in fact, that's not where the support comes from for universal health care. Um, it's not about what I'll get out of it personally, but that doesn't mean that it isn't politically potent to care about those groups and to care about um, you know, the common man, that is a very kind of appealing argument, regardless of whether that affects you personally. And obviously, I don't, you know, truly believe Trump's going to come through for that common man based on what we've seen. Nonetheless, as a slogan, it's appealing even to people who are at the top end of the income spectrum. Tom? Just picking up on that last point, um, so it seems to me trade can either be sociotropic issue or a symbolic issue. And I, at first I heard you say it was a symbolic issue, but now I hear you saying it's a How are you di di differentiating so the two? would be um, sort of appealing to nationalism, you know, that, that, this, that our trade deficit or our, our bad trade deals um, with uh, Central America and with Asia are an example of America getting beat up, getting punched in the nose by mm -hmm. these other countries. Um, nothing about the economic disaster, but just rather, they're, they're just bad deals, right? So that's symbolic, and then sociotropic is just what we were talking about. Why is that symbolic, to say that they're bad deals? Because that suggests an economic sociotropic argument to me. It suggests, oh, yeah. we collectively aren't going to benefit from this if it's a bad deal. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I guess, if that people go that far. I mean, I think they just feel like, you know, we got, you know, we got screwed over by these people, and, uh, and that's bad for national pride. You know, yeah. And less so for the sort of economic consequences. Yeah, Trump has certainly suggested that, but right. there is no predictable relationship between nationalism and trade attitudes. That is, for example, in Canada, the same measures of nationalism predict pro-trade. And, and again, it's based on this idea of a, a very different idea of who we are and how, how we want to interact with the rest of the world. They are very explicit. They don't, you know, want to wall themselves off. Um, but, you know, well, I think that's can't. different. I mean, just, they can't. Well, we can't either, Wendy. I mean, well, you know, we I wouldn't mean, survive. If you, at, if, you at, if you look at globalization in the U.S., it hasn't gone up that much because we produce most of the stuff we need internally. No, you can't even, I mean, remember the, the KOF a, index, look at it over the last 20 years. It hasn't changed. You can't build a house without importing products. We don't make nails in the United States. We, well, you know, there are people who try. So, yeah, I think people will not be happy, but I don't think people have any clue um, 
in the sense that the way economists generally think of this or, you know, IPE folks in terms of, oh, well, no, they're reasoning that this will have this effect on the economy and down the road and so forth. What we see about people's understanding of, of trade is it's very much based on folk economic beliefs. That is, uh, you know, the idea, for example, that if somebody possesses something, they own it. It's theirs, okay? That's a classic thing that people assume. That's why it's possible for us to say we own those jobs and they are stealing them from us. Um, same kind of thing. You don't, you're not supposed to um, talk to strangers, right? It's supposed to be inherently more dangerous to have something to do with people uh, who are distant and impersonal in some way. It's the same reason that people say we do, shouldn't trust these other countries in these trade agreements. A lot of this stuff comes from the world of small-scale social interaction and doesn't have much to do with economic theory or people's knowledge of the downsides or the positive sides of it. It's just trying, it's very much like, you know, Ronald Reagan saying, balancing the federal budget is just like balancing the family checkbook. Well, it makes us feel good to hear that, but it doesn't actually work that way. Um, it's not the same, but when it comes to big complex systems like this, the public is very much reassured by being able to generalize from what they do know. Um, overwhelmingly, people in the U.S. believe trade is zero sum. Just like if I trade my lunch with Herb, we're not going to end up with more lunch. We're going to each have the same. We're just trading. And that's how they view trade. It's zero sum. Whatever happens here, leaves here, goes there, and there isn't a, a larger economy or any economic growth as a result of that. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, uh, would you talk, I, I don't know, I'm trying to, you get a lot of wheels going on. Why do you need the 2012 comparison at all? Uh, in other words, why not you do 2016? Essentially, 2012 might have looked at very much the same as 2016 that Romney had made the arguments that Trump was making about trade and, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, China threat and so forth. And people might have responded. I mean, that's what Trump does. He spews things, like any politician, spews things out and those that get saluted, then that becomes their policy. So well, we being manipulated by their, by, by their followers. And Romney never did that. And maybe, maybe, it, maybe it wouldn't work in 2012, I don't know. But I don't, I don't see why you need that comparison. Because you need to see, is it that the public's attitudes on these issues changed? Or is it that the candidates' positions on these issues changed? Well, because the candidates came out with certain arguments, and the people saluted them. The candidates in 2012 did not come up with those arguments, and they didn't salute them. Well, we don't see clear evidence of opinion leadership here, though. Because, for example, you would think Trump, if he was exercising opinion leadership among his followers, people would have become more so anti opinion leadership. You just put stuff on the shelf. You know, are you scared of this? Are you scared of this? Are you scared of this? Yeah, I'm just scared of number three. You know, <laughs> then you go with opinion. it. Yeah. So well, you're manipulated by your, by your followers. You, you could be. If you manipulate them in that sense, you win the election. But then why is it that since then, since um, Trump was elected, people feel less threatened and are more pro-trade? You know, obviously he's not leading them very well, if that's what's going on now. And obviously he didn't lead them very effectively on immigration either, to see it as a threat. And I think it does have a lot to do that's with the way it's covered. That's all I don't see why you need the Romney comparison. It's just that there's another... To see where they perceived the candidates of the Republican Democratic Party to be before then. Otherwise, you know, how would we know that this was a change? Um, I wouldn't have known. I wouldn't necessarily have guessed that um, it, it was a big change in the perceived positions of the candidates, largely because all candidates have campaigned anti-trade. Um, and then they've gone and done whatever they wanted after that. I mean, but the problem is campaigning in an anti-trade mode has consequences. Um, and, you know, Obama ran into that. He tried to champion trade agreements after campaigning as if he was against it. Um, in terms of leading the public, that didn't work too well. Even though, you know, he was president. He, if he was that effective, you'd think he would have led his followers in that direction. But in terms of the declining threat, isn't it mostly just that the people who felt the most threat now don't because they won? <laughs> That's, I think, a huge part of it. I wish I had something immediately after the election to see how quickly these attitudes change because all of the threat indicators are way, way down. But we're asking people, like, do you want more free trade agreements? 
And they say, yeah. And you're like, what? <laughs> Didn't you just right. tell me you wanted you know, to get rid of the ones we had? But it could easily be yeah. two different groups of people, right? No, On they're the hand. same people. We know because they're panelists. So we know these people but, support But within Trump. that, like, it's all the Trump supporters who are now more Yes, that's okay, um, thank you. where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they think that, but Trump is actually very much anti more trade, just like he's anti more immigration. He's not, he does say, oh, well, we'll do it differently. He does hedge his bets. Uh, well, whole trade is bilateral. In the, I mean, in the mm -hmm. sense you mean rather than a, a regional agreement like right. NAFTA. He's, he's so, but, he's yeah, these people don't things. know the difference. People's attitudes on trade are, regardless of whether you ask about the TTIP or the TPP or the you know in just general trade, they're all the same answer. They're either against it or for it. They just they don't seem to have nuance involved. Uh, they don't know much about these agreements, so they don't know what they say. I, I, it's going to apply to a couple other papers, so I apologize for bringing it up for yours. Um, but when I see the, the I think the 2012 2016, uh, particularly the candidate placement, is really useful um, because you can see how voters perceive candidates mm -hmm. moving toward or against them. Um, and one of the things that brings to mind is we're almost you know, 20 minutes out from the end of the day, and no one's brought up uh, Ilias, uh, and the issue cross pressures and identifying issues that are important to voters and moving towards them and they'll come to you. Um, and it seems like a really radical notion that maybe Trump could have won some voters because people would just agree with them on the things he was saying. And I don't know how much we need the other more complicated uh, psychological. Which cross pressures are you talking about? Which so, specific one is So like, the idea that someone who voted for Obama in 2012 but disagreed with Clinton on trade and agreed with Trump would be more likely to migrate to Trump's mm -hmm. coalition because they agreed with them on, on that issue. Except they were already, the Democrats were already more pro-trade in 2012. Right, yeah. I think the specific, so the, the thing that's been missing from, uh, I think, a couple of the uh, papers that use issue attitudes has been a measure of issue importance. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of people who oh, yeah. are pro-free trade that don't care about it and aren't yeah. going to use it as being influential to their vote, whereas the Democrats who are really anti-free trade probably might consider it to be more important uh, to their vote who might be responding accordingly whereas the pro-trade Democrats are voting on other issues because trade doesn't necessarily affect Yeah, them. I think it, 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 because we had a long era of elite consensus on trade, it really paid not to have it be a salient issue during the campaign because the candidates did things like run anti-trade ads but then turned around and tried to pass trade exactly. areas. So, so just, yeah. I'm thinking back to the slide you showed where you um, have uh, the social dominance coefficient and having uh, the variance that's sucked up by the issue attitudes. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking there is, well, it's the issue attitudes that are doing the work. Uh, and might, you might get most where you need to go, but they agreed with them, and they considered it important to their vote, and they responded sort of semi-rationally. Yeah, they moved too, but yes, yeah. they were certainly a lot closer to him than they were um, to Clinton. And uh, Clinton was apparently not very effective in disavowing her connection to NAFTA, which is not <laughs> that surprising to me. But. When she came out against DPP, like, only yeah, exactly. Getting back to the psychological mechanism driving the appropriation. So, there's so many panel study, and my colleague Joey Miller's conspiracy theories before the election, Republicans are more likely to believe in them after the election. This is two weeks after the election. Hmm. Yeah, oh, interesting. That fits very well with what Eric was saying about you feel a lack of control, and that drives a lot of these with belief in conspiracies, outgroup animosity, and so forth. Yeah, that fits nicely. Uh, Rick? I have a question for Ethan, if we can go back to that. <laughs> and, uh, why, why do you think what makes Comedy Central and particularly Stewart such an important source of news compared to, let's say, NBC? or CBS. Of course, when I was young, uh, you know, I wasn't, there was no such thing. And so we had these main media sources. And I'm wondering if we could compare you know, the Stewart effect to the first paper, or Kelly's paper, uh, on this social media. Uh, is it part of just a shift away from uh, a confidence in sort of traditional news sources uh, and uh, in traditional institutions? And so we can have a comedy show as our main source for, which comedy show we could argue over, but that's why I'm cur curious. Why would we focus, but it could be, I believe your paper shows the change, 
But I'm wondering what it says about the way politics are discussed in America. And so I, I think there are, there are two explanations. One explanation is that a surprising number of people were actually you know, counting Comedy, uh, Comedy Central and The Daily Show in particular as their primary source of news, right? They, they, they simply had stopped watching you know, CBS, NBC, et cetera, right? So despite all his pretenses of being unserious and a jokester, Stewart, despite his intentions, is providing exactly the same service, right? Did he have a bigger audience? Than yeah, those, what were the ratings? Ones? No, no, the ratings were smaller, yeah, certainly, right? Tiny, but I mean, yeah. the, the large numbers of young people would say, you know, in 2004, 2005, I think 40% of people in 2000, 40% of people between the ages of 18 and 30, I forget the exact Q result, in 2004 said, John Stewart is my primary source of news information, right? Uh, which is, I think, pretty pretty fascinating. But then there's, a, I think, another another sort of side of this, which is like, yeah, absolutely. The, the extent to which uh, Stewart is popular is part and parcel of a broader story about the decline of institutions and his own sort of self, you know, ironizing, you know, you know, self-referential style um, actually is more effective, right? And his protestations about not being uh, important or meaningful only make him more important and meaningful because it allows people to be affected by him, right? Rather than, you know, the, the self-serious, uh, you know, the news anchors. Um, and, and of course, the other big part of this is that the news anchors are decidedly nonpartisan, right? Uh, they're not entertaining. Uh, you know, uh, Stewart is a partisan entertainer, right? And, you know, as a result, uh, you're going to be a little, probably let your guard down a little bit, um, and let your extent which is susceptible to move guard. The talk about politics as essentially entertainment, as opposed to talking about governance. Sure. That started a long time ago. Don't yeah. you remember yeah. Bill Clinton going on Arsenio Hall? Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, those are wise moves when they, those politicians said it too. And you know, in, if you can think of it, right? Uh, Stewart was, uh, in fact, was constantly providing Democrats an opportunity to go on Arsenio Hall and play the saxophone. Right? Stewart goes off the air. Suddenly, they have no such opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. I spent this is my second career. My, my first twenty-five years of, of my professional career was as a journalist, and. One of the things I think that Stewart did particularly well, he was irreverent, where um, most of the, the reporters, because of the institutional changes, the way they go about getting uh, news, their dependency upon the very sources, um, had stopped being um, the challenger, the open challenger. Yeah, you see some of this on the TV reporting, but when you really want to, to hear the thing that's, that isn't say you go to you go to John Stewart, or you go to uh, uh, Jimmy Kimmel these days, uh, and they will say these things. They will ask the question. So uh, even though I, I greatly appreciated uh, John Stewart consistently saying I am not a reporter by any way, or I'm a comedian, sometimes he did better journalism than the journalists. <laughs> And just to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here, um, the daily sh uh, the research by Danny Young has found, um, I think twice now over time, that people did not watch the Daily Show um, alone. They may have said that it was their primary source of news, but they were watching these entertainment programs in tandem with traditional news sources. And with the structure of humor, it almost kind of makes sense because to understand um, the jokes, you have to understand the context that's provided, which is one of the arguments why these humor shows are so um, educational is that people are uh, motivated to learn the content to get the joke so they can laugh. Um, but watching those nightly programs, those nightly, nightly news, assists with the understanding of the humor, as well as that show um, can provide knowledge, is an issue within the um, political entertainment research about how educational they are, since there is this issue that people are watching these educational programs with, uh, or these entertainment programs with the nightly news. Um, but it's not this echo bubble that uh, younger generations are turning to entertainment, and that's their sole source. You're yeah. seeking out a lot there. It's, it, I think that's very helpful, and I'm curious about this, the reverence point, because it strikes that when I listen to right-wing radio, which is known as never. Sure. I had to try to Notre Dame, which is all goes on, not last fall. It's very irreverent, too, uh -huh. um, towards liberal elites, of course, mm -hmm. highly irreverent. I'm wondering if that's what makes it popular. And why is it that I don't see any right-wing comedy shows where that irreverence is connected to humor? And on the left, I see far fewer of these screechy, irreverent kind of shows. But it seems, as we can list off here today, oh, a handful of, of left-wing groups that are attaching that irreverence with humor. 
Um, there was there was a reason our plan. I don't remember where where I saw it, but that, that made just the, the same point that the, that the styles um, are different. There are right wing uh, emerging right wing comedy shows. Um, they haven't been tremendously tremendously successful so far. And the, 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 that one was taken off Alex Swim because the only way to make right wing humor is to make it racial. Million dollar extreme. Yeah, million dollar extreme. Like I had to go off air because like, that's right wing humor. So yeah. but, but I was gonna, I was gonna make one other <laughs> one other thing. Um, some, sometimes that um, the dichotomy between listening to both the regular news and then listening to the comedy shows uh, becomes somewhat impossible for people because of the time zone, and it depends on the market and where uh, where John Stewart was placed. Um, if he was placed up against the nightly news. Uh, and this would have been the, the, the later news. Um, oftentimes, you, you wouldn't see that. But if you, you know, but if, if you have a job where you get home at a regular hour and not, not teaching night classes, right? Um, then you, you get a chance to watch both. So um, I don't know anything about time, but Dana Young and I have a piece that's coming out in Psychology Popular Media, looking at um, we wrote. This is the hardest stimuli I've ever created in my short time of creating stimuli. Um, but we wrote eight political jokes that were either exaggerative or ironic. And, and our argument was that um, the types of humor would map onto people's psychological traits, such that conservatives who have a higher need for closure would prefer more exaggerative types of jokes because the jokes were made in the direction of what an individual actually meant. Whereas something like Colbert, um, you, re you revert the actual meaning of what you're saying. And so our, our argument was is that you don't see a conservative um, version of the Colbert Report because it's just not a preferred type of humor. And what we actually found was that just in general, liberals had a higher affinity towards humor and conservatives didn't find our jokes funny um, and that it didn't map onto psychological traits. So why don't we see a right-wing um, version of these sort of humor shows? Part of it may be time, part of it may be humor preference. Another argument that Dana offers is that these late night, these um, conservative uh, programs are a form of exaggerated persona. Right? Because you've got this argument of, of Alex Jones saying he's just playing a character and he's just being larger than life. And so in that sense, it's entertaining to listen to him um, and it fills that role. But I don't have any evidence to back that up and that's her point, not mine. Uh, Kelly is trying to jump in. It's a very, so I have no expertise in political entertainment, but I have speculated around the same question and I find myself gravitating towards the last point you were just making, which is this idea that, that John Stewart, in many ways, the, the humor that he uses is more about uh, self-righteous indignation. I think that, that liberals find it funny because, well, it's funny to laugh at how dumb the other side is. And in some ways, I think that the conservatives uh, who are looking at uh, Russia and a bunch of the other conservative media get a similar sort of self-righteous indignation. So in a sense, you might say that the attraction is actually very similar, even though the, the way the programs are labeled and the, the mechanism that we usually do is to start Can I come back to Diane's paper again? So, um, and I, I want to uh, read this from the Center for American um, Progress, which recently reported, and, and ask whether or not this affects the analysis. Because we've been talking as if this election was about Trump. And obviously, he's an important figure. But I just I either want to know whether this data is inaccurate and therefore should be dismissed, or whether it's accurate or irrelevant or what. But, so they say, um, in this election, 2016, it was typically not the case that the margin shifts for a given group relative to 2012 were composed of decreases in support of one major party and equivalent increases in support of the other major party. There were usually some increases in third party voting as well. For example, among white non-college educated voters in 2016, there was a five point decrease in the support for Clinton relative to Obama, a one point increase in the support for Trump relative to Romney, and a four-point increase in third-party voting. Among white college-educated voters, there was a six-point decrease in support for Trump relative to Romney, a one-point increase in support for Clinton relative to Obama, and a five-point increase in third-party voting. If that's accurate, it seems to me that what's going on here is that um, white non-educated, uh, non-college-educated voters are fleeing Clinton 
but they're not willing to go for trouble. Yeah, I mean, that's a waste. Right? Mm -hmm. um, they're, going, uh, they're going to third parties because they can't tolerate it. I mean, so the, but they're fleeing, and, and then just the reverse. The, the college-educated voters are fleeing Trump, but they're not going to, to Clinton. And so if that's true, then we should be talking about this election and the shift from 2012 to 2016 in a very different way than I think we've been talking. To yeah. I don't think it's about Trump's personality or anything like that. I think any candidate that came and did what he did to position the Republican Party candidate differently would have produced that same outcome. Again, this is difficult to talk about because, of course, Clinton did win the popular vote. Um, so we're not talking about what caused the popular vote to uh, go one direction or another so much as what caused Trump to get so much more support than, say, Romney did. I, I mean, so if, if there's a five-point decrease in support for Clinton relative to Obama among the non-college-educated whites, that's not a phenomenon of either... You, you can't substitute another Republican who's not Trump and say it's about Republicans and it's about a new Republican ideology, right? That's a... That five point decrease is is a is a negative reaction to Clinton relative to Obama. But negative and for what reasons? Yeah. yeah. Negative for what reasons? I think is the key. Obviously, you know, she was not a popular candidate. However, there are things about her as a candidate that, you know, Trump lost Republicans who didn't like the racism. He did. He lost a lot of people that who in the past voted for Republicans very consistently. So he lost people due to that, as well as, you know, gaining people with whom that sense of dominance and lack, you know, response to threat made a difference. But every election, whether it's, you know, Romney and Obama or Clinton and uh, Trump is a function of the specific candidates in play at the time. That's why I think we have to take into account the multiple moving parts. Um, we do know that party ID, despite all the changing of the candidates, party ID is a massively strong predictor. 90% of people did just what they did in 2012. Uh, no difference at all. So yeah, some people who didn't like Clinton went to third party candidates. Some Republicans who didn't like Trump also went to Clinton and vice versa. But overall, um, what produces a net gain for one side or for another is really what I'm trying to address by virtue of looking at the shifts over time as well as how much those shifts matter to individual vote choice. Um, because some people did depart from their traditional behaviors. I think this is probably a good time to recognize that somehow this panel was uh, put down here for much longer than any other panel. That's oh, well, good. Been. How uh, nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at least a few minutes early. I'm not quite sure how that happened. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, there's a, at least a cab going back to the hotel at leaving here at 5.30. It's also not too bad. There's sun out in Columbus, Ohio. Excuse me. It's not too bad. Uh, uh, and uh, it's probably about a half hour walk to the hotel. I think that's about right. So if you're interested in getting some exercise, that's a possibility. Uh, we're, we start later tomorrow morning, thank God. And hopefully there won't be as much traffic on 315. Some of you don't know what that means. You're lucky. Uh, but so we start at 9 tomorrow morning. And uh, thanks much, Doug. Thanks.